Well, welcome everyone who is attending, uh, viewing, uh, especially if you're a student, we are happy to have you here. This meeting is being recorded. Perfect. Now it's recording. Um, I So I am the head of the QID slash CHIPS um, board for the Quality Youth Engagement Development Program, uh, which in part of that to get a our community EWSD school district to a three-star um, community is to have hold a webinar for all youth to attend with our local representatives. Uh, and this is exactly that. So I, my name is Liam Redmond and I'm head of the QID board. Uh, and I would just ask if all the representatives can go around and share their name, how long they have been serving and their committee. Great, I'll start. Um, hi everyone, Lori Houghton and I serve Essex Junction. This is my third term, so they're two years. Um, so I'm in my fifth year, I just finished my fifth year and I serve on the House Healthcare Committee. And I'll, I'll go next, Mary Beth Redmond. I um, serve on uh, House Human Services and um, this I am in my second term um, and I represent Essex, the town outside of the village. I'll go next. Uh, my name is Alyssa Black and I serve Chittenden 8-3, which is sort of the rural parts of Essex along with all of Westford. Um, I'm in my first term, so just have the one year so far under my belt. And I serve on um, House Health Care Committee along with Representative Houghton. I am Tanya Vihovsky. I am also just finishing my first term and am district mates with Representative Redmond, and I am on the Government Operations Committee. Hi, everyone. I am Karen Dolan. I represent uh, Essex Junction along with Representative Houghton, and I am on the Corrections Institutions Committee. I'm very excited to be here, part of this opportunity. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you all so much for attending today uh, and agreeing to participate. Um, so we will be asking questions from a variety of different topics. Um, but first, we will start with a climate related uh, question. So the question is, 45% of Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions are from transportation. What is the legislator, legislature doing to address this and reduce emissions? So I, I can start and then whoever wants to jump in. Um, this was a huge focus of the Transportation Committee this coming session. Um, they every year do what's called the T-Bill. It's a, it's a big um, bill of millions of dollars that focuses on transportation, um, you know, repaving our roads throughout the state because tourism is such a big part of our economy. And so having good roads is really important. But this year, they really tried to put in more intentional incentives for people to buy electric bikes, for people to um, of people within a certain income bracket to be able to um, access tax credits and incentives to, um, you know, when they buy a new car, move to a hybrid or an electric vehicle. Um, there's a lot of money in the T-bill to replace all of our public transit with electric buses in the coming years. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we are the only state in New England who's ha who has seen its emissions rising um, in New England. And so that is very concerning. And we're really trying to make some good investments. So I'll stop there if anyone else wants to jump in. I, um, I'm happy to jump in a little bit too. You know, one of the things that we know um, is that Vermont is a state where oftentimes a lengthy commute is standard. Um, and we also know that this is an economic justice issue. So one of the things that the T-Bell really also looked at is where we can expand some of these incentives or make these incentives more accessible to people who maybe can't access a tax credit or perhaps, you know, can't afford to um, upgrade to 
their car being more efficient. You know, one of the things we're also looking at is expanding what public transportation looks like. You know, in a city like Boston, you can have a subway and everyone can just easily access it. But in a state like Vermont, where we have rural communities that are many, many miles apart, having a set bus route doesn't necessarily work. So one of the other things were some pilot programs for micro transit. Um, so that almost sort of acts like a public Uber system where it's sort of set up that you can access that public transportation when you need it sort of lumped together in a group rather than having to wait for a public bus route. So we're really trying to think innovatively for how we invest in infrastructure that meets the needs of the diversity of Vermont, but is also decreasing the reliance on single person vehicle usage. And so I think we're in a really unique spot where we also have a lot of federal money to really think about how we spend that to invest in that infrastructure so that going forward, things are better, for both economically for people and accessible for people, as well as decreasing our, our emissions in the transportation sector. I'll just- Yeah. Oh, go oh, ahead. I just wanted to add in, um, that, I mean, you often don't think about it with transportation, but we've made huge investments in broadband and the ability for people to telecommute. Um, so, you know, that also plays into that because most of our um, emissions obviously are through our transportation system. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add one point in that we're going to expand um, zero bus fare for another full year, which is huge. We kind of experimented with that, making all of the public transit buses free of charge. Um, and so we're going to extend that a year with some of the federal monies and um, look toward that being hopefully um, a long term you know, solution for equity and all of those other issues, Tanya mentioned. Thank you all. Okay, so this one is more related to the economy. Um, so as we all know, small businesses were devastated by the COVID-19 pandemic. What did the legislature do to help businesses recover going forward? I can, um, I can focus a little bit on this one. Um, my husband actually is a small business owner and uh, working through the pandemic uh, was really hard. And quite frankly, it's not over. In fact, we were just talking about this morning how really stressed he has been. Um, and quite frankly, he lost sales, but he did okay. Um, it's a local business and people were wonderful about stepping up and buying locally when they could and where they could. And he's a delivery business, so it all worked well for him. But for others, um, it, was, it was devastating. And I think we all have to remember it's not over. Um, so through the various amounts of money that we received or buckets of money throughout the last uh, year and a half that we received from the federal government, we provided grants uh, to businesses. Um, there was a second round where we provided grants to businesses who um, weren't really eligible because they couldn't show a loss of business. They might have just started or were in the works. I don't know if you've noticed, there's quite a few businesses that have opened up just in the past year in Essex, which is great. So we tried to help those businesses. Um, we also did things, you know, that, that aren't sexy, but are really important to um, the businesses and that we um, uh, altered a bit the way um, their um, unemployment insurance rates are handled in order to ensure that if we had left it in place, their rates would have skyrocketed this next year. And so it's things like that, um, that, you know, the inner workings of a small business that we, when we walk into a business, don't really think about that we've been able to help them with. I will say it's not enough. And we know there are businesses still hurting and I'm hoping what we can do more when we get back in January. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add here that the other way that we help small businesses is by putting money in the pockets of Vermonters who can mm -hmm. then afford to spend money in those local businesses. And one of the things that I think that we did that was really important was in once the federal unemployment um, runs out, we increased the benefits for people on, on that system. But it's also about investing in individual Vermonters so that they can buy locally. We know from history that when we do that, that money is spent in, in our communities. So it's also thinking, you know, again, these things are so interrelated. It's, it's about thinking about every aspect of this. Another piece that's kind of connected to both of these that, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Is, um, is that one of the roles that I've found that I've played this past session is 
helping to be a navigator of communicating these things because with all of this federal funds and new grant opportunities, it, it's just been a flood of information and resources. And so a lot of the work has also been communicating with community members to say, these are the opportunities that are available because it's one place to have it there, but if folks don't know how to access it or how to use it or how it can benefit them, then it's not gonna happen. So I feel like a key part of the legislature with bringing those stakeholders together, making sure community members know how to access the resources and that they're working for them. So um, I know that uh, Representative Houghton and I heard from a lot of community members about it and there are still gaps in the system. So I'm looking forward to hearing from folks what, what still needs to be done. Like what's been working, where are the gaps and how can we move forward? Cause it's not over yet. I just wanted to mention one thing, um, Representative Houghton mentioned the unemployment insurance. Um, also not very sexy, but in the healthcare committee, we did we unmerged our um, health exchange, the market, which um, will allow um, premiums for small businesses. They will actually decrease next year. Um, I think the estimated, um, she can, uh, Representative Houghton can correct me if I'm wrong and I'm just going, but I think it was something on the order of about $16 million to small businesses that they'll save next year in health premiums for their employees. And I'll just add one final thing, uh, just that we also were very intentional about putting grant money aside for communities that have had difficulty accessing um, you know, loans and investment in their businesses. So we put aside money that was specifically for BIPOC Vermonters, um, you know, running businesses, you know, smaller businesses that, you know, maybe don't have any kind of formal bank loans. We really wanted to get money to those folks as well as um, women. We made, you know, women have traditionally had a really difficult time accessing capital investment in their businesses. So we um, set up um, funds that were specifically for those and they were all completely subscribed. So um, we're looking at that going down the road. You know, what do we need to do to make sure that there's equity in terms of how this money is being spread around? Thank you all. Okay, our next question is surrounding youth uh, slash voting rights. And that question is, you voted this past session to allow 16 and 17 year olds in the city of Brattleboro to vote in local elections. Is this some, is that, <clears throat> sorry, is that something you would encourage or expand statewide or not? So I can speak to that as that came through my committee and it was a charter change. So we voted to support the will of the voters in Brattleboro. That wasn't something that we as the legislature said, hey, Brattleboro, we're gonna give you this thing. That was something that the city of Brattleboro put on their ballot and the citizens of Brattleboro voted to change in their charter. And after the process for Vermont is that anything voted um, on a charter like that then goes to the government operations committee to be vetted to make sure that it meets its constitutional and it's you know it meets all the laws that it needs to meet and then you know we if, if changes need to be make, made, we make changes. And there were a couple of spaces in, in that charter actually where we did make a couple of tweaks to be in line with other state laws um, around voting. And then it went to the floor to be voted on. Really what that was, was like I said, supporting the will of the Brattleboro voters. And, and certainly if other municipalities want to make that charter change, I would absolutely continue to support cities and towns to exercise what they want to do for their, lo so for their local elections. So that was also a local election bill. It was saying that these individuals get to vote in our local elections. So it's very local and be, Vermont being a, a state that really believes in that kind of local control, of course we would support it if other cities followed suit. And if I recall, um, you can correct me, but I believe that was a, a student led um, petition to get on the ballot in Brattleboro. So sure I would encourage any Essex, Westford students um, to think about something like that. And I know I would fully be in support of it. I, I had a conversation with Representative Kornheiser, whose district that um, Brattleboro is, and she 
told me, I didn't know this, but this effort was an effort over like a decade to try and get this. So this was a long-term project and the students who began it are now, you know, launched in their careers and doing, you know, they're, they're not even there anymore. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, the research shows that engaging um, voters at younger ages is a way to kind of get them to engage in their local democratic elections and um, and their democracy. So, um, you know, that's that's what the data shows. And if there's interest in that here, I think, you know, we generally, as Tanya said, you know, it's supporting the will of the voters. And if the voters overwhelmingly want that, well, then we will shepherd that through the legislature. And I will just echo, I think um, it, it's a great example kind of how this forum is of engaging youth and getting ideas and hearing from and so definitely would support this as other communities take it on. I brought this up. I have an 11 year old and a 12 year old. And when this was coming up in the legislature, I talked about, well, yeah, that makes sense. And, um, and that was just hopeful to hear that they would want to be engaged and they feel like it just makes sense. And that if a community feel like, feels like that's a fit, that we can allow that to happen. And I think that actually is um, a positive way to do it. Like, let's see how that works and maybe more communities go on and then it could potentially become something more statewide. Um, and so I appreciate the charter change process for that. It allows us to, in some ways, pilot things at a small level, work things out and then develop it. I, if it's okay, I just wanna add a, another way to look at it. Um, it's a really good example of the youth in Brattleboro are coming together and working long and hard for something. And we have that happening in here in Essex as well. We've seen it with the equity conversation and we've seen it with the gun conversation. You know, that a day or two before we um, left the state house back in March, 2020, we had a group of Essex youth coming down and advocating um, for gun safety measures. And it was started um, by a freshman in Essex who decided they wanted a local chapter and she and a group of people got it going. And so, so the youth can be involved in so many ways um, and should be because the decisions that are being made today by all of us who are nowhere near beat youth <laughs> are, are really going to affect all of you more than it's going to affect us in the long run. So, you know, I think it's a good example of anything you're interested in, whether it be, you know, a local community um, organization, you want to try and get on the board, you know, advocate to get the, the board um, uh, directions changed and that youth are allowed or whatever the issue may be. And I know I can speak for the five of us when we were always open to talking to anyone about any ideas they have. Absolutely. The other opportunity for youth that I just want to put out there that also came through my committee is the Youth Council, which will be a group of youth that actually are going to be an advisory council to the legislature about the issues that are important to youth. And that was passed this year and will be starting to get up and running. So if people really want to be involved more directly in the government process, that would be an opportunity as well. Thank you all. Thank you. So our next question is surrounding gun violence and also the EWSD school system. So there are many mixed, there are mixed feelings among students about the presence of school resource officers on the premise. Do you think school resource officers are necessary in the EWSD schools? I can start with this one as I, I'm sitting here at the Community Justice Center and we work with the school resource officers. Um, for me, I feel like there, there's more conversation that needs to be had on this to figure this out. And I think it is important to bring people together. I don't think there's necessarily a, a right or wrong answer for community. I think communities need to have a discussion and figure this out. As somebody who works for the community justice center and works with the school resource officers, I, I see probably a different side than some other folks do. Uh, I see the school resource officers that want to work with um, you know, folks who are, are having challenges and working through things. We get referrals from them to work through conflict. I definitely think there are opportunities to maybe improve those pathways and maybe have it be more focused at school. Um, and um, I can also see how that would be hard to have an officer present in the school. It's like, how can we navigate that? 
I also see a lot of kids that come through um, and are scared about, you know, the violence that is happening in schools. And for some, it can be reassuring to know there's an officer there and for parents too. I feel like there's many sides to it. And the piece that I think is really important is to have a conversation and figure out where the community is at um, and listen to each other um, and figure out what is it that, that we need. I'll just add, um, back when we had the situation a couple of years ago in Fairhaven, um, and then there was a push to look at school safety throughout the state. I remember attending a meeting at Essex High School um, about what school safety should look like. And, you know, things like, you know, should the doors be open or locked? Or, and, and it was a very well-run meeting. It was um, well attended by um, the youth that were there. It was interesting. I had conversations with them there and some people after, some youth after that, they felt like their voice wasn't being heard. And in that situation, they're the ones in the school. Um, they're the ones that should be providing, you know, the input and being asked for input. And I think, I think the school district does a good job of that, but I think it's important for parents to remember, we might be worried about our kids, but they're the ones in the building and they need to feel like they are in control of the situation. And if that looks different than from what I, and I do have a son, so I mean, if it looks different from what I as a parent would want, that's something I think I as a parent have to grapple with. Grapple with. Um, so it's just a different way to look at it. I, to Karen's point, we, we really need to get the voices of the youth. And, but then I think at the same time, we need to understand, to Karen's point, there are some, some youth who need help and having the resources is important. But what does that look like? I think it will be no surprise given that I'm the sponsor on a bill that would actually stop education funding being used for school resource officers that I, that I feel that that is not the best way to get resources to people. I have deep concerns about the school to prison pipeline and we know that that kind of thing is happening even in Vermont and that that access with law enforcement in its current structure adds to that. And so I, I while I've and we also know from research that the presence of a school resource officer in the building doesn't decrease violence in the building. And so I think that it is it is exactly to the point that Lori and Karen have made it is, yes, we know that kids need resources and we need to have the conversation for what that looks like that ensures that every student in the building feels safe, including the students who do not have positive interactions with with law enforcement or don't that isn't what their view is so I think we really have to be bringing everyone into that conversation and really re-envisioning what school safety looks like yeah I I, I think the points that you all have made are, are really great uh, the youth voice you know we have we've heard from a lot of um, people who don't even have children in the school system about this issue and many others and it's always good to for people to weigh in, but we really need to facilitate some conversations at the youth level as far as what they want. And I'm, I am concerned about the research and data that um, Representative Vyhovsky references that shows that um, children of color, students of color are disproportionately interacting with resource officers. And so, you know, how, how do we, how does this shake out? I, I do think Karen's point about having some deep community conversations about this and really getting to kind of people's sense of things, looking at the data too. I think a lot of people aren't aware of this data too and what, what goes on. So I think there's an educational component for the community as well. If I can add one more quick thing on it, just because it was legislation that was passed this year that I feel like is related around um, exclusionary discipline in schools. Mm -hmm. And somebody else might have the exact details better, but um, as somebody who at the Community Justice Center, we work on situations that happen in the schools, we see that um, suspensions and um, being expelled can happen for instance at school. And it, again, I'm speaking community justice, that's not restorative. It's not helping folks get to what they need in getting folks in school. And so we passed legislation that really limits that and um, 
has schools look at it in a different way. I'm not remembering the specifics right off the top of my head. So if somebody has more of it, but I feel like that's important. That did take into consideration what is actually going to be most meaningful for youth and for families moving forward. Having them expelled or suspended from school doesn't solve a lot of the situations that we're trying to address. Thank you. Okay, our next question uh, goes back to uh, climate. And that question is, the legislature passed an important bill this session, S-20, which bans PFAS, a forever fluorine chemical found in water and the environment. Can you tell us more about this legislation and why it is so important? So I can speak to that one because um, that came through the Human Services Committee, um, that consideration. And we spent a long time on this bill, as did the Senate. Um, really looking at PFAS related to several consumer products. So we, um, we banned PFAS. PFAS are these forever chemicals, as you said, um, that are fluorine based and don't degrade. And they, buy, they um, do something that's called bioaccumulate in the body. So they don't, you know, if you drink water that has trace amounts of PFAS, the, the levels of it keep building on each other and increasing. And PFAS are cancer-causing um, chemicals. Um, and we use them in a lot of, um, lot of you know, furniture that um, is scotch-guarded and um, firefighting, um, you know, the outfits that firefighters wear to fight fires is just layered in PFAS. Um, so we essentially banned it um, in terms of firefighting foam, um, firefighting equipment, um, ski wax has PFAS in it. A lot of people who do Nordic ski racing, we banned it in that. And also in any um, consumer packaging that has contact with food. Amazingly, up until a few years ago, the little um, waxed wrappers that go around your hamburger at a McDonald's or Taco Bell, they all, they had trace amounts of PFAS in them. And so all of that um, will be banned um, going forward, um, which, which is a good thing. I mean, a lot of these chemicals have been developed. We don't really understand their impacts and now we are beginning to, and um, we have a lot further to go on this. Um, we, uh, I'll just say that industry was very loud and robust in pushing back on some of what we did. And, you know, industry has to focus as well, but public and human health is, is paramount. So, um, so one of the things that we weren't able to ban, which we wanted to, was the firefighting foam used at the airport, um, which uh, you know comes under the Department of Defense because of the Air National Guard is there. They kind of oversee that. So we were not able to ban that, but we put a lot of pressure on them and they're looking at um, substitutions to be able to use. All of Europe, Heathrow Airport in London, they're all using these fluorine-free foams. So we are going to continue to push for that. Um, you know, our pristine state is, we have to protect it. We have to protect it for future generations. Um, so I'll stop there so others might want to add. I'll share. I think you covered it, Mary Beth. I will say I did not know a lot about PFAS before this session. And this is what I think is a, an important part about being a legislator is legislators. Is you don't, you can't know everything. You can't know all of this. You have to understand what your values are, what the values are of your community, the state, and hear what these committees are doing on these topics and you know, support what aligns. And this was a clear one. Once I did learn what PFAS are and how it was like, okay, this makes sense. This is what our community needs. It was, it was easy to support. So thank you, Mary Beth, for the work your committee did. And, and I'll add one thing to your point, Karen, you know, we come from different parts of the state legislators and we have different communities and experiences. And one of the key people on our committee was um, a, a legislator from Bennington who has lived through all of the stories in the news you've, you've heard about the PFAS contamination of their drinking water down there. So due to a, a plant that many years ago was producing Teflon pans, you know, that coating of Teflon on a pan, 
Well, it ends up it's ripe with PFAS and those are harmful um, to human health. The, 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 whatever that process gives off, it has gone into the environment and polluted it. So he was an incredible wellspring of information and quickly brought our committee up to speed. Um, and it was a really, really important issue for his district. Um, and they're finding PFAS now up in Coventry where the, the our one landfill in the state of Vermont is. So this is becoming a statewide issue, but really it started in Bennington as, you know, kind of putting it on the map for us. I wanted to expand a little bit on something that Representative Dolan had said, not, but this bill to me was sort of a wake up call in a way. Um, of how the legislature works as a new member, um, you know, you really do. It, it is it is not possible to know everything, um, and it's not possible to follow everything. And the real work is done within committees. And Representative Redmond's committee spent you know weeks, months taking testimony on this and crafting this, um, and. You know, when it came to the floor, just like Rep, Rep Dolan said, it was a no brainer. Um, and the other thing that I learned, um, there is far more consensus in the legislature than I think people imagine. This was a unanimous vote. Um, so this was every political persuasion, every region of the state, this was a unanimous vote on the House floor. So this, that was a big bill that I thought, oh, wow, that's not what I thought happened. Thank you. Okay, so our next uh, question has to do with healthcare and LGBTQ plus issues. So recent data shows that LGBTQ plus and BIPOC Vermonters have less access to healthcare and less equity when it comes to their treatment. What are you doing to address that issue? Uh, I can I can talk about this a little bit. So, in our healthcare committee, this well, we did two things um, directly regarding healthcare and health inequity. Um, we had a resolution declaring um, a public health emergency, and as well, we put through um, H two ten, which was a bill on health equity and what this bill does is in this first year it establishes a um, large task force to advise on setting up an office of health equity within our department of health i mean it's clear with with the data that we've seen um, health inequities of um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, disabilities, LGBTQ+, um, all, all these, you know, different levels of health, and particularly COVID-19, um, the disparities between who it affected and who it did not necessarily affect as heavily. Um, so a commission was set up which will advise the legislature and will advise the Department of Health for standing up an Office of Health Equity that you know really can start looking at these issues, having a you know a directed department um, who will be advising across the state to make sure that we're addressing these things. The only thing I'll add uh, to that um, very in, important bill is we were able, as, as um, Mary Beth, I think it was, had said, you know, we targeted grants for businesses for women. Um, we also worked in one of the COVID relief packages to target specific money to, um, to LGBTQ and, and peer support organizations, specifically around mental health to say during the pandemic, we want money to go specifically to those groups to ensure they're getting um, the wellness care they need. So, you know, again, it's um, when you work through the process, um, you can do things, bits and pieces there. But this year with the amount of money we had coming from the federal government, we were able to really do some targeted um, outreach to different organizations. 
Thank you both. Okay, um, so lately, as many of you may know, our school board has been dealing with the critical race theory and that being taught in our school system. Um, so, so our school, our school district has been at the center of a lot of debate around critical race theory and the way history and other subjects need to be taught going forward. What are your concerns about this situation? How do we evaluate um, <clears throat> student voice in this debate? It's mainly co-opted by some parents and people from out of state. What are strat strategies for centering student voices? I'm happy to speak to this a little bit. Um, I think that student voices are incredibly important. And I think that making sure that we hear the stories and histories of all people truthfully is incredibly important, however we label that. Um, and I think that the manner in which we need to, to move forward is in really connecting to the community and making sure that the community is connected to those student voices and finding ways to lift up the experiences of our students and and make connections. I think there's a lot of fear. You know, I know that um, change can be hard. And the way that I, that in my in my work as a social worker that we work through changes by making connections and building relationships and helping people who maybe come from very different backgrounds understand one another. And I think that I think it's a multifaceted engagement of our community in these conversations and these dialogues to understand why this is critically important. And it is it is utilizing the privileges that we have to carve out space for the voices that we're not hearing to really lift up and, and create room for those voices. Um, and I'm, I'm really hopeful that that through a combination of education for our community, as well as these the making space for these deeper conversations that we can move forward in a way where everyone's voice, story, and history can be honored and recognized. I, I would echo those thoughts. I think that it's community conversation is key. And although, um, you know, the past couple months with the, the equity conversations that have been out there have been challenging and hard. Um, personally, I feel like that that's a step in the right direction. You have to break through that and have those difficult conversations. And it is kind of like, oh, that's what's needed to continue it. Because you can't move forward through something until you have those challenging conversations. It really opens up, okay, this is the situation that we're in. And um, it kind of makes things ready to, to dive a little bit deeper. And um, something I'm really happy to be involved in is with the Voices for Inclusion in Essex and Westford which is a group of volunteers that does involve uh, student voice, um, folks in the community and come together. Right now we're kind of volunteer run, and trying to figure things out. We're looking to move into being a nonprofit soon. Um, and the whole goal is around education and awareness on topics of equity and inclusion. And I feel like that's the piece as um, Tanya was sharing, like having conversations, understanding that Everybody is at a different point in that journey and understanding of what the equity needs are and how we can be an inclusive community and having some events that reach those folks that are at one point and some events that are reaching folks at another point and hopefully that we can all come up to speed and really embrace it together. So that's what I'm hoping for. It's gonna be work though, it's not gonna be easy. Go ahead, Alyssa. I just wanted to add um, because uh, and I'm speaking as a Essex resident now and as a mother who had three children go through that the school district. Um, I was, I know it's been a very difficult couple months, but I'm just so heartened by Essex Westford and the response and, you know, the community standing up to this, you know, student led um, push and supporting students. And I don't think in my 25 years of living here that I've ever seen the community so engaged on what is happening in the school district. And like I said, I know it's been a difficult past few months, but it's, it's really shown me um, just you know, how this community will will stand up and do the right thing. I'll just add quickly that um, 
you know, for someone my age, there is so much history, true history that I just never received. We never received in school. And so, you know, for a lot of us, we're, we're playing catch up, like really trying to learn and understand the true history of this country and things that have gone on and that have really oppressed other people. Um, and so I would really challenge youth to, you know, challenge, challenge the adults in your life you know, to really get up to speed, to learn the history, to read this book, you know, we, you know, we, I, I know that it can be sometimes difficult to push adults on things, but I think more than ever before, we're listening, we're open, we're, we're trying to, you know, move ourselves and really understand the, the true history of this country. And some of your teachers have been really incredible in exposing you to important texts and things. And so, push your parents, push, push the adults in your life, you know, tell them to learn and get up to speed and challenge them on some of the ways they talk about things, you know, help them. Um, you know, there, I, I think now more than ever there, we have never been more open. We're open, um, you know, and, and protect yourselves, you know, protect yourselves from adults that don't feel safe or that are, you know, find adults who, where you can be yourself and, and really push them and challenge them. So anyway, that's just a little, little addition. And I just want to commend the youth in our community that are already doing this, the student, you know, the social justice union and the youth working with voices for equity and inclusion and the youth who have challenged our school board to, to raise the Black Lives Matter flag. Like the youth are really, standing up in so many spaces on this issue and so many more on climate, on gun control. And so I just want to commend the youth for who are doing this. And for those of you who aren't sure how, connect with those youth. They will, they will guide you, connect with any one of us. I, I'm sure in this instance, I can speak for all of us and we will lift your voice up and support you. I agree and with- I already spoke. Oh, go ahead, Lori. No, go ahead. I just wanted to share an example of it that came up, and I know we're taking more time on this talk, but I do feel like it's a really important topic that's really relevant, but the Juneteenth event that happened, was it just a couple of weeks ago or last weekend, um, I think was a great example of how, um, one, growing up, that wasn't even on my radar screen at all. That was um, something that's part of our history and to celebrate, and um, Essex had its first annual celebration um, this past year. And I think many of us were involved in it in different ways or supported it. And if you were there, you saw youth were um, kind of leading the way for that whole two hour event. Um, it was amazing to hear youth embrace, read quotes. Uh, we had, it was an Essex high school student who was hosting the event. Um, like it is there. And I think as others have said, like we need to take that momentum and continue with it. Thanks, Karen. And I agree with everyone said, I'm going to take a little bit different, um, make a little bit different comment on it. This conversation would be difficult no matter what, but this is also a really good lesson that politics are at play. So this isn't just about an equity conversation in our school district. It is the fact that there is a national movement to, um, with an agenda, and it has hit our little community. Um, and quite frankly, I think we're really lucky it's taken this long to get to Vermont. You know, other areas of the country deal with this a lot. Um, so we need to learn the history. I agree absolutely with what everyone has said. I think we also need to learn the politics of it and make sure that we realize who's talking in our community, who lives within our community, and who supports our community. And to Alyssa's point, we had a groundswell of support in this community. And I think youth hopefully see that. And I hope they can separate out what might be the national voice that's coming to us now. Um, you know, we, I think as legislators and as community members and as youth have to think about how we're gonna deal with that as we move forward on this conversation and others, because I don't, see that stopping, unfortunately. Thank you. 
Okay, so another issue that many are engaged with in the community is the merger separation debate. Uh, this debate has gone on for a very long time. Many residents are tired of dealing with this. How can we put this division behind us and build a stronger and healthier community? I'll start because um, I think I've, I've just because of what I've done in the community, I've been involved in this conversation longer. I actually ran as a trustee 10, 12 years ago um, as a village trustee on collaboration with the town um, and, and worked really hard to get to where we were collaborating with the town. Um, so I am saddened to see the way we're moving, but to answer your specific question, I've always thought and, and have seen with my eyes that it is the youth that is going to keep bringing us together. So our school system, the various clubs, the sports, the arts, um, you know, my son is an ADL, but he has friends in the town and vice versa. And then in a couple of years, everyone mixes up anyway in the high school. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of loud, loud voices from a small number of people who are causing a lot of the division. And I think this is, is a little bit like what I was saying about the equity conversation. There's a lot of loud national voices um, affecting that conversation in our community. So, you know, I think if we just keep doing the community events like Juneteenth and we do the things that we've always done and we go to the fireworks and we support our kids in the activities they're involved in, um, we're not that different. Um, but we need to respect what's happening and what our each separate community values. So where they want to move, but at the same time, we can still we can still be friends. <laughs> I think it comes down to healing and relationships as, as Representative Houghton is pointing to. It really comes down to making the spaces and, and really coming to those spaces with openness to understand where someone else is coming from and openly in both directions and, and really re rebuild and heal from there. I mean, I will say I'm, I'm an Essex High School graduate and this conversation has been going on, was going on when I was in high school and has been going on longer than I've been alive. And so I don't know all of the ins and the outs of it as, as intimately and closely as Representative Houghton does having worked on it. But what I do know from, from my work in mental health and as a social worker is that the way that we heal divisiveness is by connecting and seeing where we share, what we share and how we are in most instances more similar than we are not. And then we can celebrate the spaces where we are different. Um, so I think that that's really what it comes down to is, is all of us creating the spaces where we can all come together and, and recognize each others' humanity and what we each bring to our communities. I think I'll, I'll add, I, I mean, that that's, yeah, what you both have said is, is beautiful. It's, it is about relationships and connecting and conversation and understanding each other. Um, and I, I think it's really, really important that, um, you know, we have those opportunities to have, you know, to have those kind of conversations. I think that some of the debate and um, social media, you know, back and forth has been really divisive and really mean, downright mean. And, and I think we as a delegation have made a commitment to really model like good civic behavior and collaborating and getting along. Like that's a really important value that all of us share. And, um, you know, you're not going to see us devolving into screaming matches, uh, uh, you know, with each other. And, um, and some of that has happened. And I've, I've frankly found that a little embarrassing, um, especially for our youth. And, you know, uh, we're, we're telling our kiddos not to put, you know, inappropriate things on social media. And, and this is what the, some of the adults are doing. Um, so I, I really think like getting back to a place where we can have civil conversations and respectful spaces and really hear and understand and, and sometimes agree that we're not gonna, we're not gonna agree, agree to disagree, so to speak. Thank you. Okay, so I know we are uh, running out of time, but this is a question for all representatives to answer. Uh, and that question is, what legislation is top of the list for introduction or working on for you in the next 2021 session? I'll start. 
Um, so I don't have any particular pieces of legislation to introduce. Um, in our healthcare committee, we have quite a few studies coming back to us um, that are going to be really important for us to focus on. And, you know, kind of happens in the legislature is, you know, we don't have a lot of time and we can't get to all the answers. So we create studies. And then sometimes when the next year comes, we don't even do anything with those studies. And my priority this coming January is that we focus on the things that we put in place. And a lot of it has to do with mental health and affordable and accessible healthcare, which are top priorities for me. So that's where I'm focused. I'll, I'll follow up since um, same committee. Um, so I'm really interested in working on um, affordable and accessible healthcare. Um, I feel like this year we we did a lot of um, we had to spend an awful lot of time on um, COVID related health issues. So you know we weren't able to really do any deep dives into. I mean we did a few things, but to um, Representative Houghton's point, we ordered an awful lot of studies. So it'll be interesting to see those. And I personally. Um, I'm really interested. I'm not sure I'm going to introduce anything, but I'm um, interested in advancing some pieces of um, gun safety legislation. Um, there were there were two bills that moved. One moved in the Senate and one in the House, but neither, you know, they're still to be dealt with next year. But they weren't advanced, and and I'm hoping to. Um, put my efforts in in a um, topic that is very, very important to me. I can go next. Um, so let's see, as far as legislation, um, I, I don't know, Representative Houghton and I could be introducing the first bill that I would be a part of, and that would have to do with um, a exemption independence, depending on what the vote is this November. So that could lead to a bill introduction. Um, again, where as exception, it's, but it's gonna be up to where the voters decide we want to go. So that could be a piece of legislation. Um, as, as far as other initiatives, I again, I don't have a plan of certain pieces I want to introduce, but there's a lot of time between now and the end of next year. Um, one thing that I found interesting is about being in the process of the legislature is where you also start to see where some of the systems gaps are in opportunities. So this past session, um, we in my committee took on um, a bill that was around criminal justice reform, but really opened up that there were some potential gaps in how um, services are received for victims. And so it made me curious to see, okay, how can we prevent situations like this and gaps going forward, because I really do believe in criminal justice reform. And at the same time, it's important that victims' voices are heard and um, really buy into the steps that we're taking. So not that I have legislation planned to it, but I am looking to be more curious and understand that system better so that we can support criminal justice reform going forward. Um, other than that, I feel like we have a lot on our plate to follow up from last session, COVID recovery still, and looking forward to uh, you know, boosting, boosting our state going forward. So I'll jump on your response, Karen, because the, the issue that's really front and center for me is criminal justice reform. I feel like your committee did really good work and I feel like there's so much more work to do in terms of really transforming the system. And so there have been conversations about looking at, um, like per particularly with people re-entering communities, um, those issues are more in the human services and housing areas and so affect those committees. And so I've been talking to the speaker and others about like, how do we get these committees kind of working together on this issue so that it's, not just in the corrections bucket, but like it affects services that wrap around people and it affects housing and affordable housing where people can find safe, um, you know, places to go and, and re-enter communities. So I really, I really want to start to figure out how we get committees kind of 
working side by side on this issue because I feel like we used to lead the way in this area and we we've kind of fallen behind. There are a lot of states like Maine and Washington that are doing amazing work um, and are really forward thinking. So I'm that's kind of what I'm championing. Um, there's so much that we know we need to do and, the, and there's, and I'm pulled in so many directions, but when I think about the building on the work from last year and going into next year, you know, one of the things I really want to fight for is, is moving forward with a fair and sustainable pension system. Once we hear back from the, the task force that is supposed to advise on that. Um, I also am going to be putting some effort into looking at our education funding system and how to make that more fair and equitable, um, and, you know what that looks like and how we do that the tax commission put out a report last year saying that the property tax funding mechanism really isn't the best way to do that and so that is something that that i actually have a bill that we i introduced last year with another um with i think actually 22 other legislators um that i i want to do some organizing around that and really see if we can move that forward um and then i really uh, the other big thing for me that i really want to be focused on is our larger public safety system and and redefining what that really means and looking at the pieces within that structure that we need to change so that all vermonters feel safe in their communities and feel like they can access the services and supports that they need and so some of a specific piece that i'm looking at is sort of how we do police over site. Um, and I also want to just be clear here that when I speak about public safety, we often equate that to police, but I think it's much bigger than that. I think that when we talk about public safety, it's actually about all the things we've talked about. It's about safe schools and it's about affordable housing. And so really looking at how we redefine what that means and make sure that every Vermont voice is heard and able to, to feel safe within those systems. So we have reached our one hour mark. So I want to thank all the representatives for participating today. Anyone watching, especially all the youth who signed up to watch. Uh, thank you for listening in and submitting questions. Um, but other than that, you know, thank you for everyone attending today. And I'm glad we were able to put this on. Um, I think we can end recording and you are all free to go. Thank you so much.